the the phrases football field and fire should seldom be together in the same sentence. That's just not okay. Uh, out of the out of the ashes, so to speak. God, that's a bad pun. Uh, we're going to talk about a different kind of science. Something something that might be called pseudoscience to some. I want you all, all, to give a warm welcome to the, for the very first time, Mark Lindsay. All right. So because this is my first time speaking at Odd Salon, I really think before we get started, we really need to get to know each other first. So in that light, I have a few questions for you all. Uh, first, if there were a fire truck to pass by on the street, would you A, chase after it to go see the fire, or B, continue on with whatever you were doing? A. a? Okay, we got a lot of A's here, good crowd. Um, next question, how do you feel about soda fountains? Do you enjoy them, or do you sp like spending your time on other things? Anyone? Soda fountains? We've got soda fountain fans here, great. Um, so as you may have guessed, these are two of the original questions from the original 1943 version of the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. And if you have ever taken a Myers-Briggs test, or maybe gone on a date with someone who was just really into the Myers-Briggs test, <laughs> you may have thought to yourself, you know, where the heck did this stuff come from? And the answer is from these two women, uh, Catherine Cook Briggs and her daughter, Isabel Briggs Myers. And our story begins with Catherine who was born in 1875 in East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, she was a devout Baptist, and her, both her personal life and her professional life really revolved around raising Isabel. So she was a published author. She had a recurring column in the Ladies' Home Journal called The Diary of an Obedience Curiosity Mother, which was 50% autobiographical about her and Isabel, and 50% instructional on how to raise a good, proper, obedient Christian kid. Um, so you may have imagined how devastating it was for Catherine when Isabel grew up, moved out, went to college, rebelled, and worst yet, she married a socialist. Ooh. And no joke, this put Catherine into a really deep depression, one that she didn't pull herself out of for, she says, years later, when she encountered the work of this guy, Carl Gustav Jung, the Swiss founder of analytic psychology. So, Catherine read Jung's book, Psychological Types, which was published in 1921. And in Psychological Types, Jung outlines three different pairs of types. So sensing versus intuition is about how you process information. Thinking versus feeling is about how you make decisions. And extroversion and introversion, this is one that's actually very different from how I think of it today. So for Jung, extroversion had nothing to do with whether you got energy from interacting with other people. It was more about uh, whether you focused on the external world after you made a decision versus your internal world. And an example of what he means, um, he used this example in his book where he said, um, if it's cold outside, an extrovert might put on a jacket, external world. An introvert might just deal with the cold and treat it as an opportunity to steal themselves psychologically. <laughs> so those of you who can you consider yourselves introverts, like try that on for size and let me know how it goes. Um, so Catherine actually added a fourth pair to this, you know, judging versus perceiving. This one wasn't in Young's book at all. Uh, Kath Catherine was inspired to add it in based on her own background. And people who were judging uh, tended to be authors of their own destiny. They tended to be deciders, whereas perceivers tend to react to things that happen to them. And so it's really, really hard to understate the impact that these psychological types had on Catherine's life. She felt that virtually all of her problems in life could be explained by this typology. It, was, it didn't have anything to do with her failing as a mother or as an author. It was all because she failed to understand other people's psychological types and treat them accordingly. So you could consider this a sort of epiphany because she came up with a solution to a lot of her past problems, but I actually think it meets a different version of epiphany. So Merriam-Webster also defines an epiphany as an appearance or manifestation, especially of a divine being. Hmm. Catherine told Isabel that Young appeared to her in a dream, showed up at her house, told her to spread the gospel of typology, and then left on a pale white horse. No joke. Um, <laughs> Catherine used to refer to Young as my new God, which is an amazing statement for someone so religious. 
So what did Catherine, you know, do to spread the gospel of typology? Well, she did the most natural thing possible. She wrote poetry. So this one is called Hail Dr. Young. It goes, signs and symbols reading, Young gives proof exceeding. He knows all humanity, understands old Adam, not to mention madam. Wise old owl, so wise is he. Upward, upward, consciousness will come. Upward, upward, from primal scum, individuation is our destination. Hawk, heil, hail, Dr. Young. Wow. Well, I'm convinced. But it wasn't just poetry that she wrote. Um, Catherine also wrote homoerotic fan fiction. Yes, no joke. So in a, no in a novella called The Man from Zurich, Catherine wrote about a very lightly fictionalized version of a character called Dr. Marcus, who had a liaison with a character called Sterling. Um, Publishers didn't like this manuscript at all, both because of the homosexual content and also because all the long digressions into Jungian typology they thought was you know, very boring. Um, so she did write a lot of you know, more magazine articles about how to find your own psychological type, but it's important to note that Catherine's approach was to teach Jung's type to you, and then you decided you know, what types were yourself. There was no notion of a multiple choice test which you know, spit out the answer of what type you were. That came later. That was the work of her daughter, Isabel. So Isabel had graduated from college. Uh, she was working on her own burgeoning career as an author, and she had a really severe case of writer's block while she was writing her mystery novel, Murder Yet to Come. And she solved this writer block because she realized her mom had this system of like 16 different personality types. That's like 16 different characters. Um, and it worked. Uh, Murder Yet to Come, uh, she finished it. It went on to win a bunch of awards, became a bestseller. Unfortunately, her next book didn't do as well. Her publisher went under during the Depression. And so Isabel had to get another job at the Educational Testing Service in Princeton, New Jersey. And, you know, her job at ETS was to work on what was called the Hums Wadworth Temperament Scale, which was a multiple choice psychological test that gave you a number from one to five where one was a normal person, three was manic depressive, four was a schizophrenic, and five was someone with OCD. I don't know why that one is the highest, doesn't make any sense, but um, yes, exactly. Um, so Isabel, this didn't really resonate with her at all. Like she had learned from her mother that people could be one of many different, 16 different to be precise, psychological types, and all of them were you know, distinct and had their own advantages and disadvantages. And so she pitched to her bosses the idea of creating a multiple choice test modeled after Hums Wadworth, but that gave you not you know, this crazy five point scale, but one of the 16 different personality types. And this became you know, the Briggs-Myers type indicator. Um, after someone at ETS pointed out that most people use you know, the initials of these tests and BM had scatological implications, she switched around the name and it became the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And uh, Isabel wrote all the questions herself and the two that I opened you know, this talk with were are actually from that test. Um, and so ETS started publishing and actually started selling this. And the very first customers were actually very influential in the future development of the test. So this guy on the left is Henry Murray, a Harvard professor of psychology. And the guy on the right is one of his grad, grad students, Doug McKinnon. And they were hired by the Defense Department during World War II under what it, the Office of Strategic Services, the uh, entity which we now know of as the CIA. And they ran a station called uh, Station S, and their job was to assess for incoming recruits. Were they better suited as a spy or a paratrooper or a desk job? And they actually bought the Myers-Briggs uh, typological indicator and actually used that to sort people. And it was relatively successful, you know, but after the war, their services were no longer needed. And so they were invited by UC Berkeley to come out here. Uh, Berkeley had a problem where, uh, thanks to the GI Bill, a lot more people were going to college than ever before. And so the first time they had to like, figure out who to let in and who to not let in. And they thought maybe psychological tests were actually the answer. Um, so McKinnon moved west. He set up what was called the Institute for Personality Assessment Research, or IPAR. And um, his approach for working on and validating the psychological test for academics was to basically set up what I consider the first version of a reality TV show. <laughs> So he invited academics, authors, artists from all across the country, stuck them in a house in Berkeley, mired them 24-7, made them do a barrage of psychological tests all day, along with a bunch of cooperative uh, exercises and creativity building exercises. Um, it was a lot of fun until Truman Capote, this guy here, actually kind of screwed it all up by getting very competitive during some of the creative exercises. The thing had to get shut down. Um, 
After Murray and McKinnon reported their results to ETS, they decided that you know, Myers-Briggs was not suitable as a way to determine college admissions, so ETS actually uh, stopped working on Myers-Briggs, stopped selling it, and focused on their other main product, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT. Yes. We were. So I like to think that you know, if it weren't for Truman Capote, we would have all taken personality tests instead of the SAT to get into college. Think how crazy that would have been. Oh yeah. So on the plus side, um, Isabel was now free to do whatever she wanted, and she started a couple new entities: uh, the Center for uh, Applications of Psychological Types uh, and a new for-profit entity called the Myers Briggs Company, which is still the company that sells the Myers Briggs to this day. And with the shackles of academia now removed. They were able to be much more aggressive at selling this to corporate America, and corporate America ate it up. Uh, throughout the 70s and 80s, um, the Myers-Briggs test became extremely popular as a way for HR departments to sort people into managerial roles versus other roles. So perhaps some of you have encountered that, yes. So you all were going exactly where I was going. Is any of this science? Yeah, I think so. Young's original psychological types didn't even come from any experimental observation at all. Uh, he did kind of a, a literature review of different cultures, you know, religious and cultural traditions, and basically psychoanalyzed major historical figures from people across the world, and therefore deduced that there were these innate psychological types. Um, and McKinnon and Murray, with their work at IPAR and ETS, uncovered two really damning results for Myers-Briggs. The first was that people's personality type changes. Uh, whether from life, life events or just because of your mood that day, they would administer the test to the same people over and over again in that Berkeley house, and different results would happen every time, which is not supposed to happen if you're uh, being told what your innate true personality type is. The other one, perhaps even more fundamentally damning, is, well, take, for example, extroversion versus introversion. If it's really true that everyone is an extrovert or an introvert, you'd expect roughly a bimodal distribution, where if you ask a bunch of people a bunch of questions about extroversion versus introversion, there'd be a cluster of results over on the introverted side, a cluster on the extroverted side. They found the opposite. There was a standard bell curve right along the middle. What this means is that most people are partly introverted and partly extroverted. It depends on the context. Who knew? Um, so because of that, uh, you know, nonetheless, so I, I would say this is definitely not science. Um, not science, yes. But Myers-Briggs still became very popular, continues to be popular to this day. Millions of people take it every year, whether because their HR department tells them to, or this online dating site tells them to, um, either way. Um, and so why does it resonate with people? And I think it goes back to one of Isabel's key insights when she first joined ETS. Uh, prior to Myers-Briggs, all the other psychological tests were all about distinguishing what was normal versus what was abnormal. And despite not being very rigorous, what Catherine and Isabel really gave the world was a vocabulary to explain to people how different personality types could be different, but still ultimately just as valid. And so with that, I'd like to make a toast. To all of us and each of our individual personalities, they might not be able to fit in 16 different buckets, but they're all special in their own way. Thanks. <laughs>